Hey, this is Gerd Tundall, and welcome to the Inner Light Project. This show is for anyone who's wanting to lead a happier, healthier, and enlightened life. Create more self love, inject more joy and abundance into their daily life. Join me for inspiring interviews and spiritual topics so you can shine your inner light. Hello and welcome to the Inner Light Project. My name is Gerd Tundor and today I want to share with you somebody who has over 22 years of healing experience, spirit medium and quantum healer. Amira Hall is a world-class mentor and spirit of compassion. She healed herself from autoimmune illness and believes that we all have the ability to heal from within. Hi Amira, I'm so grateful to have you on the show and thank you for being in the space today. Thank you. It's such an honor to connect with you. You're doing amazing work for so many people. Thank you. Oh, bless you. I'm just excited to hear your story because you've, wow, you've been through like some amazing things and like you've come back from a near death experience. That's so powerful. Well, I did. Yeah, I guess so. (laughs) (laughs) Um, It was definitely transformative. I think my journey started before that. I mean, that seemed to be a big kickoff, no question. It was a huge launch (laughs) in a new direction. But, you know, my journey, I'm a a Canadian born and I married an American, came to the US and I was reflecting on it, you know, before our call, my journey started before I knew it started. And I think Mm. that's true if we reflect back and look back at some time periods. And I've got a little more, you know, ground under my feet for my spiritual awakening. So, so reflecting back on it, I could see, you know, I, I had to get my footing in a new country. And and that was monumental. And I think a lot of people don't talk about it, because I don't know why I haven't heard people talk about it, but it's massive. It's massive. And even though we had relatively similar cultures, I was in massive culture shock. And Mm -hmm. that's traumatic. And so I'm saying that because I'm grateful. I'm I'm ever grateful for the experience, but not to dismiss what impact that had on me. And when I got my footing, I got launched into the corporate environment. I bought into the whole American dream and making more and doing more and success. I was on the fast track to get a bachelor's degree. I was um, number within the top 10 in, in a sales team for the nation. And I was graduating from a bachelor's degree. Uh, yeah, I said that right. But I was a yes. magna cum laude <laughs> student. And so I was intense on my work, on my studies. Well, next thing you know, my, my relationship, my marriage started crumbling. And um, at the same time, my dad died in Canada. So I was really going through a lot of internal, you know, combustion. It was, it was upheaval in every angle. Um, And so soon after that, I was diagnosed with the chronic fatigue syndrome. And the doctor I had at the time told me death or wheelchair. There was no other option. And so, yeah, I, another trauma that paralyzed me for several weeks of crying nonstop, you know, I had very few friends at the time, very little support system, and my family wasn't anywhere near. So there was nobody, right? And so I, I can relate to anybody who's in that spot of being you know, alone or feeling, even if their family is next door or down the road, if they abandon them or think that you're, you know, making things up. So that was pretty, pretty intense. And keep in mind, well, this was in 1991. So there was no internet, right? And there was no concept of really, that was the first time I heard of chronic fatigue. Mm -hmm. Luckily, I found an internist that told me I had emotional trauma that need that was the trigger for this. Thank God. And then I found an acupuncturist that um, led me down a path of understanding Well, she would she said to me, we don't look at this as a disease. So she helped me unlabel it. And it's not a disease. It's like your body's broken down, and we're going to restore the flow, we're going to restore your natural function. And that was, that was a huge opening for me because I started to reframe it 
and not diagnose myself or keep that label. So every time somebody says, oh, I've got chronic fatigue or I've got autoimmune, I'm talking to you right now. But honestly, it gives me the queebie jeebies every time somebody says those words, Mm. because it's not. I mean, it is, but it isn't. And what I mean by that is there's an energetic component that's created a a symptoms that can be reversed. First of all, that's what I want to say. And I did it. I started detoxing myself. I I learned, I was detoxing and doing um, cleanses, 30 day cleanses way back in the early, in the mid nineties. Wow. And keep in mind, this was probably an eight year journey. Okay, slowly plodding along, going organic, driving, you know, 15 miles to the closest place that I could find and finding farmers. And so it was it was difficult and it required I mean, this was all I had. These were my only options. There were no doctors giving me a solution. And I was running out of money because I lost my job. I was now divorced. My dad died and I had no money. I mean, the, the, the funds were dwindling, right? And I often, people often say, well, you know, Medi-Cal or Medicare or whatever, you know, the system didn't cover any of the treatments that I was choosing. So I was left to spend my own resources. And people say to me, oh, well, that's out of pocket. And I'm like, tough titty, you know what? It's, you got to do it. And so I, I did what I had to do. I didn't stop where the system said no go, right? Yeah. I chose alternative ways and because I wanted to live. Wow. No, and, I, sorry, I was just going to say, you know, I, can, I really relate with what you're saying. Like, just going back to a bit of what you were saying earlier, like when you move away from it to a different country, it does affect your nervous system. I have noticed that um, because I I moved to Canada back, gosh, we're talking 2010. um, I was working at CTV National News and it was like a culture shock for me. It was like I'd gone from like the British way of thinking to a Canadian way and thinking, okay, I don't understand how people are behaving. I don't understand. Are they being friendly? Are they being me? (laughs) Trying to understand your bearings. Like, you know, obviously money is different and it did play havoc on my system. So I really relate with what you're saying. Yeah. And and, and I don't know that anybody addresses that or helps people resolve that. Or, you know, we just keep on going, right? Because if you've moved to another country, you go, well, I just got to pull it together. I got to pull my bootstraps up and I'm going to make it happen. This is my dream. And, you know, we just push forward. And I, yeah, I think that's um, counterintuitive in many ways. It's all in the survival mode. Um, But yeah, I, I, so that was, it's kind of like the uh, immigrant trauma in a way. Yes, absolutely. And, you know, when I see these refugees from various countries, mm-hmm. um, you know, like from the Middle East, I, I just can't imagine. I mean, mine was a cakewalk comparatively. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when, when you engage in, in, let's say, a business uh, relationship with anybody from those areas, that in itself is going to be different, isn't it? your trust levels, your, um, you know, just, yeah, the whole experience, the foundation is quite different. So yeah, I was internally, you know, bouncing a lot of balls and trying to reconfigure and find my path. And yet moving here to the States was probably the most profound thing. I don't think I could have grown where I was Mm -hmm. given the time period to where I'm at today you know, all those things definitely played a part. Um, I remember going to counseling because I feared divorce and I kind of got tired of talking about it (laughs) with the counselor and the therapist, you know? And so I completely relate with people that are just get sick and tired of just going around and around and around. (laughs) I needed a solution. Mm. I wanted the bottom line, get me out of this pain let's do it, whatever it takes. So that's where, you know, when it all, when the cookie started crumbling, that's sort of just where I was at as I wanted to, to, you know, end it. And I had to find it. I just want to say a salute you for actually finding a solution, because even in this day and age, I know there's so much information online, but sometimes you don't know what to trust. Um, 
and even like I've had my own health problems so like I um my left arm stopped working in Canada had to regenerate it eating disorders depression um a kidney problem which I now actually recently healed um but again like you said the system doesn't tell you or give you a solution they just say you have to live with it and it's like you almost have to come out of the matrix to like or like to realize actually there is a way to heal but it's not the way the system tells you to heal well and I think this is all a component of this you know great awakening this great Mm. spiritual awakening and it's almost like we have to be broken down to not trust what we've been told that reality (laughs) isn't real or Mm. it was a reality and I don't want to get everybody you know spun up here but it's it's like what reality do I want and Mm healing the physical body your emotions are a a huge component to that I I think it is the sort of besides your environment emotions are it Mm. Um, I think your thoughts are directly related to the emotions but what comes first right the chicken or the egg and (laughs) I I really think Um, unplugging for my dysfunctional family was part of it Mm -hmm. coming to the States and and giving me permission. It was almost like a frame of mind that I had permission to do something different, to go against the grain Mm -hmm. because in Canada, it's very much so, Oh, whatever the government says you just do. And I know that's an overgeneralization, but that's pretty much it. Right. Yeah. (laughs) And in fact, my own family kind of divorced me because they said, well, you're so American now. (laughs) It was just like, you know what I mean? That yes, Canadian kind of jealous cousin attitude. Yeah. <laughs> but there's always that rivalry. And I'm mm. so proud of Canada right now for everything they're going through and what they're yeah. doing for themselves. Um, but it is all about freedom and it is about spiritual freedom. It's about soul's freedom. This is bigger than just what we see as movements around the world. Mm. Yes, we're calling for freedom and wanting that, but it's, personal sovereignty Mm. it's being able to connect with that divine guidance that inner gps that will show you the answer for everything Mm. yeah so i want to just go back a bit so you so you're on your journey your father's passed away your divorce is happening you're trying to heal what what did you do next Well, I started getting really strong and healthy and I was working as a jewelry designer and an artist and that wasn't bringing in enough money. So I had to go back. I went back into corporate. Oh my God. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. This is what we do to ourselves, right? It's really a trick. And so I figured, okay, I was an early adopter of work at home. Okay. In 1996, Mm -hmm. I created a space. I'm going to work from home. My commute is short across the hall. (laughs) I'm going to (laughs) go. I could meditate in the morning. I've got my nice little space. Um, and, And so I found this company. I said, this is what I want. I want to, if I have to fly or go anywhere, I want to fly. I'm not driving. I want you to pay for my computer um, my the printer, the fax machine, because back then they used real fax machines. <laughs> and um, yeah, and so I set up my own schedule. And I was on the phone all day in sales. So I could go swimming at noon, because that was what my spirit needed at the time. Mm-hmm. And I would meditate in the morning. And I was doing great until I was making so much more money. I mean, I was into six figures in 1997. I thought, okay, there's something missing. What's missing? Okay, duh. Okay, I'll go on a spiritual journey. Mm. I found a somebody gave me a flyer, one of my friends, to Peru, because I kept hearing this do 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 do, this little voice, and I'm like, uh, I knew it wasn't me, but it was, it was a song, it was a chant, it was a calling. Mm. And later found out it was the shaman in the Amazon that <gasps> I was literally connecting with. And so I embarked on that journey. I cried from the time I left San Diego to the time I landed in, in Lima, Peru. Strangers on the airplane were comforting me. I was sobbing. <laughs> I thought I was going to die. Oh, <laughs> I, I, and I've traveled a lot, but I thought I was going to die. And a big part of me did die there. Mm. 
-hmm. Okay. So it wasn't what my conscious mind thought it was going to be. It was a huge step for me. It's a rebirth. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Keep in mind, I've always been curious about the unseen world. I was raised Catholic, but I always had a curiosity Mm -hmm. because people wouldn't talk about it. I wanted to know more about it. Like my, my grandfather from the other side, he would, he came to me before he passed and my aunts. And so I always had connections with others from the other side. And it, and, and I kind of dismissed it because I didn't get the validation from my family. Yeah. So over there, everything started opening up. I had, I, I didn't know what ayahuasca was. And there I was in the jungle and they're, they're going, we're going to start the ceremony. I'm like, what ceremony? <laughs> like, <laughs> what's, you know, what is this? And, but <clears throat> I had been detoxing, as I said, I'd done a 30 day detox and I was clean and I was ready, whatever it was, I was going, going into it. And so they brought out this um, ceremonial uh, I don't even know. It's not really the juice. <laughs> they called it juice. I think cocktail anyway it was sacred pardon me um the journeys there was three days the first journey was monumental in that um i had a head cracking headache and they worked on me the shamans worked on me for about two hours at least it felt like two hours my head was going to crack open and they prayed and prayed and chanted and were doing all this healing. And then all of a sudden, there was this huge waft of smoke that came out of my third chakra, uh, pardon me, my third eye. And at that moment, I knew it was a spiritual teacher I had been working with in San Diego. He called himself a shaman also. And I got the information that he was plugged into my third eye my sixth chakra, trying to, he was really extracting and and sucking off the juice and the power of my own uh, sixth chakra. And I knew in that moment, I had to sever ties with all those people that I was involved with. Mm. And I also found out later that the shaman didn't want to do the ceremony, because they knew somebody was going to go blind in the ceremony. And that person ended up, they didn't tell me till later, that was me. (gasps) What? Yeah, yeah, that was, you know, I kind of sort of just rode the wave <laughs> out of that. But, um, and, and, and I don't really talk about that a lot. Um, because, because I guess maybe it was so profound. And because it was so personal, that I don't often share that. So I just feel incredibly honored and privileged now that that occurred. It wasn't easy. I mean, everybody was puking around me. Um, I didn't because I had a completely clear system. Wow. You but it was purged a lot of it beforehand. Yeah. Yes. The physical part. Yeah. But this was an energetic component that I would have never guessed at that point in my life, in my career, in my path. Mm. Now I can see those things very clearly with people. And you could say in a way it was, in a, it would, it was almost like an exorcism. But people don't understand when you said earlier, like people get confused, they don't know who to connect with. Many, many teachers out there don't know how to manage their energy. Mm. And they are plugging in unconsciously, I don't say that they're intentionally going and using the juice from someone else. Um, But that that is very common. I see it a lot. And I remember one lady I was working with, and I said, did you have a guru? Was there somebody that, and I could literally see a cord at top oh. of her, six, her seventh chakra that she was, she thought she was, well, she would go and get her spiritual information from the guru when wow. the guru basically channeled the information from the divine. So many, many people out there are not getting juice from the divine, even though they think mm. it's divine. So they go to the ashram or the temple or the church and they, and you know, this is, yeah. this is across the board. They think they go into that environment and they're feeling really great. They're all pumped up. <laughs> Why? Okay. Because you got some juice, but then you don't really have your own juice keeping the fire burning. Thank you for saying that. Oh my God. I, I'm so glad you said that because oh, I've been saying this for years. <laughs> 
you know, you have to have your own self-awareness. You have to know yourself. You can't rely on a guru or a teacher or a healer. Like if they're not teaching you how to become self-aware and how to understand your energy, you're never going to heal. No. And, and, you know, there's a lot of incredible, you know, fancy dancy (laughs) marketing, schmarketing, great stuff out there, bells and whistles. Um, I got a, a message from one of my longtime clients and she goes, oh, I'm, I'm, I'm in school again. She's a nurse. Okay. And she's, wow. she, she was part of the whole pandemic in, in San Diego and feels very um, heavy hearted because she, mm. she's waking up to the fact that she feels really responsible for oh. a lot of things that happened there. So she's looking for healing while well, she signed up for this training here in the States and it's got Reiki and it's got this and it's got that. And I'm going to get all these certificates. And I'm like, you don't need them. <laughs> you one, you, Yeah, you don't really, you think you do because that's your programming thinking the more certificates I have, the better and smarter and more powerful and more money I'm going to make. Right. And um, it's just a big fat lie. Yeah. It's just more of the same delivered you know, on a different plate. Mm. And, and, and unfortunately I've witnessed, I've been on this path professionally working with people one-on-ones and trainings for 22 years. And, and it's dismaying to me to witness how many people get sucked into these dead end, you know, yeah, just a waste because you can't, you can't just download something and expect to, listen to 528 Hertz and you're going to be awakened. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you're making me laugh because it's funny you say that. Sorry, Sorry to say it like that, but it just, <laughs> it's not going to shift it. It is. You're, you're so true. Like it's so true what you're saying. So like, um, back in 2020, I was diagnosed with kidney disease. So I had an operation before to save my kidney. Um, I didn't know I was born with a kidney defect. I, I learned that when I was at, th- when I was, when I turned 30. Um, so being in my mid thirties now, you know, I get the, the doctor says, Oh, I've got kidney disease. I'm thinking, ah, what do I do? I share with a few people who I'm close to. Somebody says, Oh, listen to some Hertz. This frequency will help you. And, and I just said, this is not going to help me right now. Please stop. But in their mind, they thought that's going to heal. Oh, yeah. That wasn't what I needed. In the end, I did find the healing and I thank God, the universe, like I've healed, I've reversed it, but that was through diet and through knowledge and understanding what my body needed and and replacing things that, that, that weren't serving me. But people, like you said, people automatically go, oh, you listen to this and this will help you this. And it's like, no, you need to really tune in and to ask your own soul, what do you need? Um, but I also want to just say, Amira, is also about gurus. I have a big issue with the word guru. I think if you're calling yourself a guru, it's coming from an ego place. Um, so I'm raised in the Sikh background. So mm. I'm not highly religious. I'm very spiritual, but I'm very connected. I know the knowledge of Sikhism. So gurus to us is people who are sharing spiritual teachings. So they're people who've passed away. There were 10 Sikh gurus. So for me, when somebody tries to label themselves like guru, blah, 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 you're disrespecting somebody's religion. And also you think it's, it's also coming from an ego place because nobody's a guru. Like n- we all are human beings and we need to respect that nobody's higher or bigger or better than anybody else. So I have a really big issue when I see online social media, people calling themselves gurus. I'm like, this is not coming from a humble state. This is coming from an ego place. And unfortunately, I'm going to share with you, I was in Egypt on one of my many trips, I I guide people to Egypt on spiritual journeys. And on one of the trips, I was meditating on the on the balcony. And I was asking, like, what is what is the spiritual awakening? What is this whole big movement all about? Mm -hmm. I didn't, I know I read the books, and everybody talks about it. And I just wanted my own information. And and Mm -hmm. the message I got, and this was 2009, um, imagine today you're a caterpillar and tomorrow you're a butterfly mm. and beware there will be many charlatans among you. <laughs> yeah. And I think about that so much. And I, I flash on that when I get lit up myself, like when the secret came out, mm. I mean, everybody's wow, raving about the secret and it is wonderful yeah. to start with. Yeah. Um, 
but I, I found that it did a huge, it sort of was sort of cracked the egg, so to speak, so that people could, you know, start thinking different. That was huge, massive movement. So they, they contributed massively in my opinion. However, I would pace the floor. I would scream and shout in my house going, this, th this is just blasphemy because mm -hmm. they're leaving out the secret ingredients. They're leaving out the most important part, and that's your energy and your unconscious. Mm. And yeah. granted, maybe people couldn't grasp that at the time, but it's the, okay, they did sort of talk about the feeling, but okay, okay, I feel this new car. I feel this new car. Oh, it smells so great. Oh, okay. <laughs> that's not it. I'm sorry. You, you know. <laughs> Uh, there's just so much more than you trying to just brainwash yourself and reprogram yourself in another way. It's like saying mm. a prayer, like lines in school when the teacher said, I will not be late for school anymore. <laughs> I will not be late for what happens. You're late because you have set in place. The brain doesn't understand the negative aspect to that. Right. Mm. It's your soul's not flowing to what you, you need. Period. That's it. Mm. Period. It's flowing. So it's soul. It's your vibration. It's your yeah. frequency. And, you know, um, I started dancing this morning. I got up early and then this oh. I put on this music and I went, yeah, why not? I And before that, somebody had sent me this, you know, it's not really conspiracy. It's reality. But I... <laughs> It was negative. It was dark. Oh. It, was, it wasn't, it wasn't, um, there was no hope in it, you know, and <laughs> that was in my sphere. And I went, okay, we got to shift this. Mm. This is just not where I want to go. And it may be happening in our world. I don't want to be head in the sand type person. It is, there is a shift and things are getting ugly in a lot of different ways. Yeah. However, What's my purpose? What am I here to do? And what reality am I here to, to create? I'm not going to stay stuck in that vibe. And it takes work. Yeah. It takes a lot of work. And back to your comment about, you know, people are so overwhelmed with information, you know, whether it's negative or positive. You know, and we talk about our spiritual work and our healing. Um, people are confused with that too. <laughs> um, you know, so that's where we've got to get quiet and we've got to align with somebody that I think we resonate with. Mm -hmm. Really tune in to that. I think being discerning right now is uber important. Mm -hmm. yeah, highly, fine. highly, highly critical. You have to find somebody that you know you can trust. I think just buying into a program is not going to help you heal. It's like, can you see yourself in that person? Do you feel a good energy? Are they doing it to generally help? And it's not because I want to take your money. And I think that's where you will heal, if I'm honest. Um, I just want to go a bit like back. How are you helping people to reach a higher level of awareness? So, so can we take it to another Go for it. <laughs> I'm just a wee back, a wee bit back. Um, is that after Peru, I got the message that I, well, in Peru, I got the message that I was a star seed that came through a stargate in early Egypt. Wow. And all those words and terms were absolutely foreign and new to me. So I said, in that moment, I'm going to Egypt next year. There I went. I went on a spiritual journey to Egypt. And I extended my stay and had a near-death experience. Mm. And that was triggered by sort of a, <laughs> oh, it was a random experience. I was buying some beads for the jewelry I made and they were antiquities, but um, it was a friend of a friend. And in Egypt, have you ever been there? I haven't, no. Okay, so it's it's sort of a, a ritual that when you buy something, especially if you know somebody you visit and they bring you a Coke or some tea or some water and then you just visit and before you exchange the money. Okay. It's sort of like a process. Well, instead of coffee or tea or Coca-Cola, they brought out a joint. 
<laughs> I, I, yeah, this was in 1998. Okay. <laughs> I'm not anybody that indulges in that. And I don't smoke. And so they brought it out and I said, no, thank you. I don't smoke. Well, I'm the only female there. And it was in a little rinky dink factory. All of a sudden, Muhammad shouting at me and screaming. And if you've ever seen excited Egyptians, you know, it was intimidating to me. You know, I was sort of shrinking in the corner because, you know, I didn't realize quickly that I insulted him. Mm. And so he kept saying, it's the best, it's the best and shouting, shouting, shouting. So I thought, oh, geez, I, I tried it before, you know, I'll just, okay, you know, I'll just do a little sort of ritual process and it'll I'll be good you know we'll get up and go well it went around twice there were probably 10 people there <laughs> that came out of nowhere it went around twice and the joint was finished everybody was bounced up and ready to go except it didn't work that way for me oh my arms wouldn't move and my legs wouldn't <gasps> move and I was pinned to the chair and I found myself standing behind my body oh <gasps> So, wow. you know, I was leaving my body. I could see everybody that in, was in the room. I could see like I was looking at Circuit City or some TV store where everybody had a different movie playing. I could see all their life unfolding. And then I, I started feeling like I was being pulled away from my body and, and everything was going black. I remember holding my hands out in front of my face and asked, I must have said water, but I don't remember hearing that come from me. And everything was in slow motion, me bringing my hands to my face and my friend walking towards me, putting water in my hand. And <laughs> the last thought I had was, oh, shit, my mascara is going to run. <laughs> <laughs> and so, I, you know, it was like completely, I was just so neutral, except, you know, talk about ego, to, mm. you know, hanging on. <laughs> so um, yeah, I, I, I blacked out. And they said that I collapsed. Uh, my friend told me that he was pounding my chest with all his might, because my heart stopped. And my breathing stopped. They dragged me out to the road, and they hailed a truck, which was the taxi. This was outside the Valley of the Kings. It's a very primitive little village. There is no luxury amenities um and it was right outside the valley of the kings so that is what death's doorway right it's the <laughs> tombs of the world and there i was oh, I mean, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah there oh. i was i do everything pretty dramatically when i do it you know otherwise i kind of lay low <laughs> um so yeah so they were taking me somewhere and i i don't recall that until I felt myself like a shooting star coming through the galaxy and I was looking for, I didn't know what, and then the earth appeared. Oh yeah, I'm there. And then it kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger. And I'm like, Oh wow, that's a big place. How am I going to find myself? And then I heard this language and I didn't recognize a foreign language. Then I remembered, Oh, I'm in Egypt. And then I tried getting into my body and it felt like trying to put on a wet wetsuit or wet clothes. And it was yucky and heavy and sticky and it took me a long time to really get in it. And then I remember the, eye, the light being so bright, touching my friend's arm because I could hear their, their voices, trying to reach out and find somebody next to me. And, and, and he just started shouting in Arabic and they freaked out that I came back and, and it was just a chaotic scene, but I was totally bliss. I was just totally calm, except my tummy was rumbling and I knew there was some action happening. Down oh my God. <laughs> and I knew I needed a bathroom. And so, you know, I, I said, the first words out of my mouth, where are you taking me? And they said, well, to the hospital, you know? And I'm like, I need a bathroom. <laughs> so that was a bigger emergency for me with the bathroom. And I thought at the moment, oh shit, an Egyptian hospital will kill me. I mean, we're primitive there. I mean, it was, 
<laughs> you know, things have changed a lot since then, but it was extremely primitive. And I thought, oh my God, the germs and the, what, what, what would be the point, right? Mm. It brought me to the, the friends, his, his uh, brother-in-law's flat, because that was another issue is trying to find a Western bathroom or toilet <laughs> or somebody in like a primitive village, right? <laughs> because I couldn't stand. Mm. So uh, all their bathrooms are like holes in the ground. Yeah. <laughs> so I couldn't do that. <laughs> so, so it's kind of a comedy actually, now that I look back, but sure as heck wasn't they they carried me up three flights of stairs they um I got me to the toilet and I'm thinking I'm so proper I got my dress down over my legs and I insisted my friend stay with me because I was really wobbly and really not sure and he just streamed tears down his face he just cried and cried and Aww. cried he said you died you don't understand he goes you died mm. so I started yes. seeing things after that. I started seeing through dimensions and I didn't know what was happening. Mm. So my sixth chakra was blown a wide open. Mm. Um, I felt this overwhelming bliss and love the whole time. And that same day I had to travel from Luxor to Cairo, Cairo to New York, New York, Atlanta, Atlanta, San Diego long trip. <laughs> so by the time I got off the jetway in JFK, all I could see were black and white paper dolls walking. Every person is a black and white paper doll. And I was horrified. I was alone. I was stuck in what I felt was grief and anger and depression and fear. Mm. And Gerd, this is what I think we're in right now. People are snapping out of this amnesia, hmm. this two-dimensional concept of reality that we've had. Yeah. And maybe that's oversimplifying it, but that metaphor rings true for what is happening on the planet now. And I was stuck there. I was stuck there for about nine months. And I went to probably a dozen different healers and, and psychics trying to find out what happened to me. I knew I had gone far away and I had come back did I die? Didn't I? It was an out of body, whatever. You want to label it, go for it, right? It doesn't really matter. It was a spiritually transformative moment that catapulted me into finding out what happened. And what I started to understand was, and I had a, a stream of consciousness of what I, I, I saw a review. I had a review, but my review showed me a timeline of little pinpoints of everywhere that I had blocked emotions or stuck energy along my lifeline that caused my illness. Oh, wow. From my chronic fatigue to whatever else was going on. And that was monumental and pivotal for me because one, I, oh, okay, great. Now I can do something with that, right? To me, that was so liberating. Great, mm -hmm. let me dig it out, right? It's just like, Okay, um, got to change the sheets on your bed. Okay, I'm going to take off the old, the old ones first and then step by step, you know, put the fresh ones on. But I had a process or I had to find a process. It started to come down to me, download it. And, I, um, and that's what I teach people now. And I've been teaching it for 22 years because what happened was my clairvoyance was so sharp after I started to clear the blocks. Okay. Um, this is why I believe everybody's empathic. I believe everybody's psychic. Yeah. And everybody can learn how to activate that six chakra by balancing and aligning those energy centers and systematically purging, releasing the blocks that you don't know are there, but are there. Mm. So that's the journey that I've, I've embraced. And it's, 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 it's grounded. It's practical. It's realistic. You know, what used to be a one-year mentoring program with me is now 12 weeks. So things wow. have definitely speeded up a yeah. lot, right? Yeah. Um, and so moving with that, the tools still work and they're grounded in, I, I, I call it a blend between the sacred and science. 
So I was practicing and working with this concept of the quantum field before I had a word for it. Mm. So in my near-death experience, I started to see that and, and able to access it and remove it. That's to me was pivotal. And um, yeah, I just love having tools that you can recreate and use over and over and over and they never fail you. Wow. Gosh, (laughs) I'm just blown away by your story and what happened and like how you had that aha moment. Um, I really can relate with it. I was just going to say, I really relate with it. So when I woke up in the hospital from, it was in December, 2017, after my operation, I woke up and before um, my podcast, Amira, was called Get Inspired with Gerds. And when I woke up, I heard in a light project and I realized everybody has a light within themselves. So my sensitivity went like to another level. Things that I, like you said, I didn't notice started raising up to the surface. Old patterns, old wounds that I thought I'd cleared came rising up and I had to really dive in deep and just finally let it go. And when I did, it made me realize like oh gosh life's too short why are we holding on to so much baggage like we need to live in the present moment and do what's right for us this system that we've been living in has clouded a lot of what we were here to do like a lot of people don't know who they really are because we've been following this system for so long but we already have the knowledge within us we just haven't learned how to tap into it I just um published my new book um the essential guide to spiritual awakening and in there i talk about my near death and all of the the information that i did get and on from the other side but more than that it's like we're waking up from you know twenty thousand years of amnesia Mm -hmm. in terms of the soul and our journey and granted many people aren't ready for that right and they are waking up and seeing things or hearing things and they don't know how to deal with it (laughs) right i mean it is kind of freaky when you start and, and especially if you don't, you have family like mine that just say, well, no, there's no angel in the room or there's no yeah. grandpa isn't with us. You know, he's, he's gone. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Well, and so that's kind of the family I had. They invalidated everything and our gifts are turning on and, and, and probably like I have a client in Saudi Arabia who he worked with me in his, um, he wanted to develop his clairvoyance and he was already doing energy work and healing work, but he didn't have that aspect really, you know, refined. <clears throat> so as we did the work, even after the training, he was like, I checked in with him. And I said, like, you're not really happy with the level of your clairvoyance, right? You had an expectation that it was going to be different than what it is. I always tell my students is that we all see differently. You're not going to see exactly the same as me, yeah. right? And you're going to maybe use a combination of your clairaudience and your clairsentience and just your claircognizance, just knowing that a lot of people are happening. But what happened was the process continues to simmer, so to speak. And then like six weeks after he calls me up and he goes, Mira, you're not going to believe this. I'm seeing the organs inside my <gasps> clients' bodies. Oh my God. I'm, going, I'm jealous now because I don't see like that. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So wow. it's a great, it, it's a great story and example that we're all going to mm. see different Yeah. and we're going to use our abilities different. I mean, I'm fully expecting to be able to walk through walls and wow. or somebody show up in my room, you know, um, there's going to be abilities that are going to turn on. I think that none of us have anticipated. Mm. That's how wonderful I think it's going to be. I feel like the people that hear it the most are people who are living in the rainforest who are like shamans or teachers in the rainforest because they're away from technology. They're away from this fear world, fear-based world that we live in. I feel like they are so in tune. They can even hear when like certain sounds or like animals that we wouldn't necessarily hear because we're not tapped in the same Well, there's no question that we're bombarded with a lot of external, um, I'm going to call it diffusion, Mm. you know, that kind but we were incarnated here in this space, you in London, me where I'm at to, to influence and radiate and, and just, just that to be brilliant. If you did nothing along the lines of an energy work, let's say you worked as a, 
barista at Starbucks or something, mm. just for the lack of, not that I'm, yeah, just, just to pick a company. Yeah. It doesn't matter. <laughs> you're just radiating. And if you're present and, and, and heartfelt and holding that vibration, mm. then you're doing the work. And this morning, as I said, I was woke up early and I was meditating and preparing and just pondering, you know, where, where are we going to go with this conversation? And um, Jesus appeared to me and Mm -hmm. Jesus, the teacher. And it was an interesting experience. He's, he's come to me and communicated many times, but this time it's like he stepped over me. Like his energy field was bigger than mine. And it was interesting how his heart completely encompassed me. Mm-hmm. It was, it's almost like it zoomed in and I could feel this energetic, you know, dynamic dance occurring of just raising that love vibration. And that's what's happening. Mm-hmm. I mean, you know, and for all of us, as I said, I got that message that I inadvertently opened that was all fear-based and this is what's going down and then Jesus appeared right Mm -hmm. so it's like okay Amira focus on what you want to create focus on your vibration of being clear and strong and radiant right that's where we have to focus yeah we, we we can see that on the peripheral that other stuff is going down we still have to hold that vibration that's the training Mm. not get sucked down that rabbit hole of chaos okay (laughs) because within chaos there can be a stillness Mm. we want to find that stillness how can we be grounded how can we stay focused on what we want to create and that would be those are those are two of the most important things i think right now for anybody how do you get grounded how can you be present Mm. Very really hard. anchored to mother earth how can you feel that yeah that's so true gosh <laughs> i'm just paying attention to everything you're saying I'm like wow yeah because if we do it right now just i teach my students to just from the base of your spine draw a line or a laser beam i i sometimes use a usb wire plug mm-hmm. and just magnetically connect it to the base of your spine So activating the first chakra, but all the chakras, you know, the nervous system, everything can just release down that grounding cord and secure it at the base at the center of the earth. And then we can just activate gravity and just allow gravity, which we know is real to just begin pulling out whatever nonsense, (laughs) (laughs) noise, um, disturbances, uh, wherever you've been our feathers have been ruffled to just let it go down that grounding cord Mm -hmm. with no effort. And at the same time, teaching ourselves and practicing to be in the center of our head. So when we're in the center of our head, when we can learn to be in that power point, it's the place of power. It is like being in the top of a lighthouse. You can have 360 degrees. But if I say to you, Gerd, what's going on with your lower back? you just went there. Mm. Okay, your spirit just left the center of your head. So if you <laughs> come back to the center of your head, I can see you do that. And so it's that, that's how quick our spirit, whatever we think about, we go there. Mm. So the practice becomes becoming more and more well, mindful is a word, but grounded being present and having a clear space um, in that six chakra space so that you're not looking oh I gotta did I leave the iron on in the other room or gee I gotta call so and so oh darn it the dog just chewed my my shoe and you know whatever the stuff is that's hitting us all of that stuff is just gonna have to be released from the center of your head Mm -hmm. and that's back to gurus that's how many of our made master teachers where they were that's how they could see that's how they could plug into the divine Mm -hmm. Wow. Yeah. So learning how to master our energy field from a Western perspective is what I do. And I teach people how to heal themselves, how to um, get their own answers. You know, is this business model a good path for you? 
Um, for instance, I helped a pr princess get pregnant, not in the traditional way, mind you. <laughs> um, but when I was in, living in Dubai, I worked with a royal family, many of the members of royal family. And um, <clears throat> she, she had no passion. You know, um, she would go to bed with her kids at, you know, eight o'clock at night. And for that culture, it's extremely unusual, right? They usually stay up all night. <laughs> but anyway, she, so when we started working together, I started finding out a few other things that she really wanted. And one was she had three children. She, they were all IVF because the doctors told her 18, when a number of years ago that she could never get pregnant naturally. Yeah. yeah you, you probably can relate because the doctors are, you know, tell us yep. certain things. <laughs> so, um, she was, she had a fourth IVF because her job is to get pregnant and have babies, right? That's yeah. the princess's role. So she, that failed. Mm -hmm. So her sister actually found me and they summoned me to the palace, uh, working with her. I'm fast forwarding over like six, six or eight sessions. Everything started shifting. She called me up and she goes, Amira, I've got this passion. She goes, I'm staying up all night. <laughs> and I'm, I hired a coach. I said, what are you doing? She goes, I'm trading. I said, what are you wow. trading? I'm thinking cell phones or a bias. What could you be trading? <laughs> anyway, I wasn't, she goes, I'm trading foreign currency. Wow. I'm like, wow. And she goes, I created this charity that all the money I make is going to a children's charity. Oh. And her husband started coming home early on Friday. He had never done that in 15 years. And he started taking her into the guest bedroom. And <laughs> both of them were getting really frisky. And she was really kind of so cute. She was mm. like, you know, embarrassed to tell me about it. I said, did you have fun? He goes, yes. Oh my gosh. Guess what? A couple of weeks later, she called me. She goes, I've got news for you. And I go, yeah, you're pregnant. And she goes, how did you know, Amira? <laughs> I swear I thought you were a crazy lady. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, a lot of people think I'm crazy, but I've been called a lot of things. So I'm getting used mm -hmm. to it, you know? So yeah, she delivered a happy, healthy baby boy naturally. Aww. And she said to me, Amira, you gave me the biggest gift anybody could give me. Aww. A gift of feeling like a real woman. Wow. Wow. And that's something that you and I of the world probably take for granted, mm. right? Even having our cycle every month. Yeah. Well, curse it, you know, until it stops. And then we wished we had it, and, you know, uh, just, it, yeah, we're just not grateful. And I think that's what the Jesus moment for me this morning is having that space of, you know, just unconditional love and just being grateful for where we're at where we're going and all of our incredible abilities if we just allow it yeah so true yeah that's an amazing story by the way and it just shows what you're saying like it's energy everything is energy if your energy is vibrating at a low vibration that's what's going to happen and that's what you're going to attract but like she was in this state of positivity and just trusting in herself and her body was like right here you go <laughs> Yeah. Now it wasn't a hit and miss. We, we yeah. had to sort of continue the process every week mm. for six or eight weeks, right? We were building the energy field mm. so that she could hold the energy field. Ah. It's like a new frequency that she was not accustomed to. And I remember telling her and asking her, what happened when you were 18? And she said, Amira, I cried for two weeks. I was planning to marry one man. And my family made me marry into the royal family. Right. That makes sense. She, yeah. She was, a, she was a cousin, but that would mean such a huge shift in her life path that she literally shut down her baby maker, as I call it, the second chakra, mm. her creativity, her production, reproduction. Mm. And so the doctors, she, they brought in the top medical teams that money can buy from Europe mm. and they were all set up and they were blown away blown away that it happened because wow. the energy was in alignment it was the root nobody had looked at the root cause and you did That's you right. found the root and pulled it out yeah that makes sense yeah wow 
And there was a lot of other benefits that came along with it, but she wasn't even, those weren't her (laughs) goals, but they were her goals. She just Mm. never verbalized them. Right. So that's what starts to happen when we come online with our spirit, right? Mm. Amazing gifts start to surface. Wow. Not to mention, you know, activating the law of attraction that we talked about, you know? Yeah. (laughs) Yeah. (laughs) It's beautiful. And yeah. we are coming towards the end of the show. It's gone really fast. I didn't realize until I looked at the time. Um, what are your five top tips for somebody who's having a midlife crisis and they don't know how to shift? Well, it's all about what you're not. Like we've come to believe we're something that we're not. The first thing is learning how to ground mm-hmm. learning how to ground and be present, clearing the center of your head, as I spoke about learning how to have healthy boundaries and removing foreign energies that aren't yours, Mm. you know? And I would say learning how to use the cosmic and the earth energies to just, it comes down to removing what you're not. Mm. And all of our history, all of our experiences, our dramas, our traumas, um, that has to be released. And the, tr- the, the, the midlife crisis is it's waking you up. It's shaking you to the core to say, you're on overload. You're maxed out. You're way overdrawn. Let's start releasing it mm-hmm. because it's not for me to tell you what is next for you. It's for you to reveal it to yourself. Yeah. And that's why I call my, my journey, um, initial journey of reveal. It's, re- it's a process of going through the chakras of clearing the baggage that you don't know is there. You've been storing it like the princess since you were 18 or since you were five or, you know, all of those little marks on your timeline are what we start clearing. Beautiful. Wow. What are you most grateful? For? I don't know if that was more than five or, or less than five, but that was five. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> I was counting this five. Okay. Okay. Thank you. <laughs> and, and what are you most grateful for? I'm most grateful for my ability to connect mm. with others in ways that are um, life changing. And I'm humbled with my abilities. I continue to work on them, but I am extremely grateful to know what I know and to be able to hold a vibration for other people too. Beautiful. And what shines your inner light? Hmm. Well, Jesus showed up this morning. I mean, (laughs) (laughs) that that was pretty profound. Um, I have so many of these moments. Um, get so many messages from many masters, um, even um, ascended masters and ETs. And I just talked to the Arcturians. So they keep me going. And, you know, I, I think working with clients that are ready also and open because that's our connection, you humanity, right? Re- realizing that we're also connected. I mean, Gerd, you and I have so many similarities and we just yeah. met right yeah it's amazing to me yeah there's so many we haven't even discussed them but I can, yeah it's, I it's beautiful yeah thank so you so I want to share those tools that I just spoke about is sure. I have a drive-through method it's a free dr- download called stress buster it's on my website and people can access that and start today they can just start purging the backlog of vibes that uh are ready to be released. So I invite you to that. Beautiful. And we'll be adding that to the link on the website where you can just click the link. And thank you, Amira, for being on the show. And thank you for just being yourself and really trusting what you were here to do in this world, because you're helping so many people be a better version of themselves. Oh, many, many thanks for you also holding the space. You're you're an amazing light worker. Wow. What an amazing interview with Amira. It just shows that You never know when the universe, higher power God is going to send you on that journey to go from within and to trust your inner wisdom. It really just shows also that life is too short and we should surrender to what the universe has in store for us. We never really are in control of anything. There's already a plan written out for us. 
For more information about the show or how to trust your inner light, visit my new coaching program at gerdshundle.com. Unfortunately, that's the end of the show. Before I leave, I want to leave you with this quote. Sometimes a little near-death experience helps them to put things into perspective. That's a quote by Anne Shropshire. Take care, my sisters. Bye. And remember, stay happy, stay healthy, stay lit. Lit.